Ruchim Habay, and welcome everybody. Glad to be with you for another phenomenal uh, Cyber Week. Um, Future of Privacy Forum, Israel Tech Policy Institute has been proud to help program some of the privacy programming as opposed to the security programming. We can get into the difference if anybody wants to debate it, but they are very different strategies. As you know, sometimes they're very good friends and sometimes they're opponents because obviously a lot of surveillance might provide a lot of security and a lot of safety, but might be a huge challenge for individual autonomy. Uh, and so looking at some of the AI issues, obviously we embrace those exact challenges um, but we've got an audience uh, and we've got a expert group of uh, presenters who have been grappling with many of these issues for many years. Maybe they called it big data a few years ago. Uh, maybe they had different terminology. Um, but I think the co data protection community, the data protection regulators very clearly see that they are today the lead regulators when it comes to many of the AI issues. If you heard um, the president of the Kinnell's keynote, not only have they been the data protection regulator covering things like automated decisioning and all of the issues around processing of personal data, which obviously underlies so much of uh, AI, but for France in particular, they will be empowered to be the AI regulator. Um, delighted that it is uh, in France and hopefully in others at the same agency, because I think many of us have seen regulators dealing with open banking objectives and privacy, but not the same regulator and sometimes creating conflicts and controversy between the competing demands. And so certainly I think we all hope that by having the regulatory activity happening at one agency that is you know, already deep into questions like what are the legal issues around automated processing when the enhanced issues and the enhanced risks come up, they will be well suited. So I'm delighted to introduce to you or reintroduce to you the uh, Marie-Laure Denis, the president of the French data protection regulator. Um, in many ways, not only will um, uh, the commissioner uh, and her colleagues be setting data protection law for France, but France has played a lead role in European data protection law broadly uh, through its seat on the European Data Protection Board and because it's had a deep and expert team that has been uh, advising and shaping and opining on European wide issues. And of course, increasingly, as you all know, the European legislative system, whether it's the Brussels effect or whether it's the GDPR just being a very significant model has influenced world regulation. So I think we're at this cusp today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit with our uh, panelists about uh, where we see the US going and where we see the rest of the world. But I'm delighted to call up the president of the Kinil to share with us some deeper views on the future of data protection and AI regulation. Please. Thank you, Jules, for your kind words. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Dear colleagues, I'm honored to have been invited to speak at this event on intelligence uh, of artificial intelligence governance, which intervenes in a shakeout moment for all of us with the launch of ChatGPT. The development of AI comes with significant challenges in the field of data protection and individual freedoms that the CNIL has been working to address for several years now. Since the publication in 2017 of its report on the ethical challenges for, of algorithms and artificial intelligence, the CNIL repeatedly pronounced uh, on the issues raised by the new tools brought about by this new technology. In particular, generative artificial intelligence has been developing rapidly for several months whether in the field of text and conversation via large language models, but also in those of imaging or speech. Those foundation models and the technological bricks that rely on them seem to already find many cases of application in a variety of sectors. Nevertheless, the understanding of their functioning, their possibilities and their limitations, as well as the legal 
ethical and technical issues surrounding their development and use remain largely under debate. Considering that the protection of personal data is a major challenge for the design and the use of these tools, the CNIL has published an action plan on artificial intelligence, which aims, among other things, to frame the development of generative AI. Um, its implementation will rely in particular on the newly created artificial intelligence department dedicated to these issues. What this, with this action plan, we pursue uh, four main objectives. The first one is to understand the functioning of AI systems and their impacts for people. The innovative techniques used for the design and operation of AI tools raise new questions about data protection, in particular the fairness and transparency of the data processing underlying the operation of these tools. Second question, the protection of publicly available data on the web regarding the use of scrapping of personal data for the design of tools. Third question, the protection of data transmitted by users when they use these tools, ranging from their collection via an interface to their possible reuse and processing through machine learning algorithms. Another question is about the consequences for the rights of individuals to their data, both in relation to those collected for the learning of models and those which may be provided by those systems, such as content created in the case of generative AI. Another question is the protection against, I don't know how you say it in English exactly, the pronunciation bias and bias. It's better like this. Okay, thank you. And discriminations. And uh, maybe a last question, but there are many more, of course. The specific security challenges related to the statistical nature of these systems. These aspects will be one of the priority areas of work for the Artificial Intelligence Department of the CNIL Digital Innovation Laboratory, which is called the LINK. The second main objective of our plan for artificial intelligence is to allow and guide the development of AI diary that respects personal data. Many stakeholders have told the CNIL about the uncertainty surrounding the application of the GDPR to AI, especially for the training of generative AI. So in order to support actors in the field of artificial intelligence and to prepare for the entry into force of the European AI regulation, the CNIL already proposes doctrinal work and educational content. More work is ongoing and we will soon submit for public consultation a guide of the rules applicable to the sharing and reuse of data this work will include the issue of reuse of freely accessible data on the internet and now used for learning many AI models. We will soon also publish documentation on designing AI systems and building databases for machine learning. The third objective of our plan for artificial intelligence is to federate or to try to federate and support innovative players in the AI ecosystem in France and in Europe. CNIL's AI regulation aims to bring out, promote and help prosper actors in a framework that is faithful to the values of protecting French and European fundamental rights and freedoms. This support already undertaken takes three forms. First, first of all, for the past two years, the CNIL has launched a sandbox program to support innovative projects and actors, which has led it to focus on AI-based projects. The sandboxes on health in 2021, on education in 2022, uh, thus made it possible to provide tailored advice to innovative AI players in these areas. The CNIL will soon open a new call for projects for the edition 2023 
uh, which will concern in particular the use of uh, artificial intelligence in the public sector, uh, the relation with uh, governments and collectivities and, and people. Another example of uh, this support of actors is about a specific support program for providers of automated video surveillance, surveillance um, that, the clean, that the CNIL launched in the context of the experimentation provided in the law on the Olympic and Paralympic Games that we, you know will be held in Paris in 2024. Finally, we opened in, in uh, this year a new enhanced support program to assist innovative companies in, the, in their compliance with the GDPR. The first winners of this reinforced accompaniment are innovative companies in the field of AI. More generally, the CNIL wishes to engage in a sustained dialogue with research teams R&D centers and French companies developing or wishing to develop AI systems in the logic of compliance with personal data protection rules. Finally, our, our last objective is to develop our auditing capacity and control of AI systems. In order to monitor compliance, it is essential for the CNIL to develop a tool to audit the AI systems submitted to it, both ex ante and ex post. Our control action in 2023 uh, will focus or is focusing in particular on compliance with the position uh, of the use of augmented video surveillance that we published a, a year and a half ago about by public and private actors. Also, uh, the use of artificial intelligence in the fight against, against fraud, for example, in the fight against social insurance fraud in view of the challenges, of the challenges linked to the use of such algorithms. We will also investigate complaints complaints lodged with the CNIL, and you may be aware that we have received five complaints against OpenAI in relation with ChatGPT, and we opened a control procedure. A dedicated working group has been set up within the European Data Protection Board, which uh, gathers all the European CNILs, the member of the European Union Data Protection Authorities, to ensure a coordinated approach to the European authorities. In that context, the CNIL will pay particular attention to what actors processing personal data in order to develop, train, or use artificial intelligence systems have developed um, in compliance with the basic requirements of European data protection law. Carry out a data protection impact assessment, DPIA, to document risks and take measures to reduce them. Uh, take measures to inform people plan measures for the exercise of rights of persons adapted to this particular context. As you can see, CNIL, as well as other European DPAs, want to actively participate to the AI regulation that will be put in place in the next five to 10 years. We are, already to, we are ready to work with industry and academia and to input into the global dialogue the specificities that Europe requires. We will focus on the short time on data uh, protection and privacy and expect that regulation issues will broaden the near future, especially with the AI Act. Our experience shows that the protection of individuals is a key factor of trust for new technologies and it is very important for policymakers and regulators to be able to combine this protection with the support to innovation in order to build sustainable and privacy-friendly AI systems. I commit to this ambitious yet reachable goal. I thank you for your attention and wish you an insightful debate and thank you again for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. So I think it's clear to all of us that uh, the uh, 
France and the European regulators, whether it's the AI Act or whether it's the data protection regulators um, using their authority, um, are clearly going to be setting uh, major rules and uh, we'll soon see perhaps some guidance uh, because of the uh, chat GPT uh, investigation across Europe that will give us some understanding of what these rules are going to be. To get into some of the real details now, and we will take questions at the end, so please do um, um, uh, have some in mind. Let me call up our uh, panelists who will uh, help us uh, investigate what is going on elsewhere in the world. Please come on up uh, and I'll introduce them. Um, first here to my right, Kate Charlotte. Kate is head of global privacy, safety and security policy in the government affairs and public policy group at Google a company that has had something to do with AI over the years. Um, Audrey Plonk, head of the Digital Economy Policy Division in the Directorate for Science, Technology, and Innovation at the OECD. If you've been following the global debate, uh, the OECD seems supercharged in the past couple of years, uh, really advancing um, uh, consensus uh, increasingly on issues that I think many of us thought uh, it would be a challenge to have global democracies um, uh, advancing. And uh, I give some of that credit to uh, the crises of forcing us all to cooperate and some of it to Audrey and uh, her team who have stepped up to uh, meet those goals. And so we'll hear a bit more about the uh, OECD's AI agenda, but ho how it is actually relevant to many of you who perhaps are, you know, I'm just gonna worry about cl clients and counseling. What do I need to worry about OECD? That's nothing to me. The OECD's AI principles have been incredibly influential on the regulatory process. And so uh, Audrey will share a bit more uh, about that. And of course, welcome to Israel, Kian O'Brien, uh, Deputy Commissioner at the Irish Data Protection Commission. Uh, Kian is on the enforcement side and so um, uh, wields a bit of the, the stick. And so uh, helping us understand how uh, one of the leading regulators in Europe, where obviously many European uh, and uh, global companies are headquartered, uh, and uh, a uh, enforcer that has been handling out billion dollar fines uh, recently. So uh, let us listen uh, closely. And last but not least, of course, Uri Gabay, CEO of the Startup Nation Policy Institute, who will tell us a bit more about uh, the uh, unique Israeli innovation place in this space, as we all know, SNPI has been uh, great. All right, so let me start over here. And uh, so, Kate, uh, so let me uh, do what I'm saying. We reinvented a lot of these uh, underlying technologies and things that we must know. Transformers that are what the latest generation of standards are going to be built on. So, uh, it's not a new surprise to be on this uh, debate. How are we doing now? All right, this is probably easier. First of all, thank you all so much for having me. Thank you, Jules, uh, to the rest of the to the rest of the panel. So I think you know these issues aren't new. We have been thinking about AI governance and AI policies um, for for years. Um, if we think about all the AI that is built into our products, um, you all have been living those products for for years. Whether that's just routing and maps, you know, spam detection, all of that is driven by AI. But we are in this um, new moment that has been driven by kind of the popular um, uh, conversation around chatbots. Um, we, um, as Google, have. Uh, AI principles um, that we have had in place for years that have guided all of the development of our AI related um, uh, products, um, ranging from fairness to transparency, making sure that everything, thank you, making sure that everything is um, uh, focused on a human oriented approach. Um, and one of those, one of those AI principles is privacy by design. 
So every product um, that we analyze through our AI governance model really has at its foundation um, uh, privacy by design. So I think um, as you see BARD, if anybody has played around with our uh, uh, chatbot uh, uh, BARD, you're going to see the same principles of transparency, human-centered design, data minimization, um, guiding through through um, that product and all of the products that we're um, uh, going to be delivering in the future. Let me jump right in with a hard question, um, and then we'll go down the line. Um, uh, uh, children. Uh, we saw Italy um, immediately block uh, ChatGPT, um, and one of the key issues evidently was that children could access it and ask it scary questions and get uh, maybe you know dangerous responses. Um, on one hand, if only the wealthy or only people with parents who can give them credit card consent and get them in uh, to use this tool uh, have access to it, then uh, a lot of uh, uh, children and teens around the world won't won't have access. Uh, but on the other hand, it's a pretty powerful uh, tool. And, uh, you know, do we want people saying, create a great plot for me to run away from home and uh, never be captured by my parents or or who knows? I mean, we, we can imagine sort of scary uh, use cases. Um, probably not a new issue. Obviously, other tools, search and others uh, raise these questions. But uh, how do we think about whether children or younger teens should have access to um, these sorts of tools? Yeah, so I think there's a couple questions to unpack there. One is a broader question about age assurance, and that is not a new part of the conversation, right? There are various methods, and you all just released an infographic on this. There's various methods of ensuring um, the age of a user on an online uh, service. Uh, and as with anything, they are appropriate to different risk levels. Um, you might go for hard age verification with an ID when you're talking about a very high risk um, uh, you know, high risk service like adult services, or when there is a very low risk, then you might um, not to not need to go all the way to mobile driver's license, which has its um, its own kind of trade offs with privacy. Um, so there's an age assurance question there, and then there's a question as it relates to generative AI. Um, one of the products that we just announced uh, recently at our developer conference, which is I.O., uh, was using generative AI to use natural language to create a wallpaper out of emojis on your Android phone, right? That's a low risk kind of use of AI, right? There are going to be different risk use, use cases. Um, but we're also part of a conversation, a really important conversation, about how does generative AI connect to the world of child sexual abuse and exploitation material, right? So there's a spectrum of risk, and we need to be thinking very carefully about it. Now, our, um, our chatbot, BARD, is available only for over 18, but we also recognize there are going to be very important opportunities and use cases in the educational context or um, uh, for, for teens. Um, so we all have to think carefully with children's groups, with parents, with families about um, what the risks are and how we can take a risk-based approach to mitigations, understanding the different, um, you know, the different levels of um, cognitive capability of children at different ages, which grow um, as they uh, get older, as you're thinking about disinformation uh, in or hallucination of a chatbot. Those are things that, um, uh, you know, children at younger ages may not have the you know, tools and may not be as equipped as adults to really understand what the differences are. So we're going to have to work really closely together with um, children's groups. Actually, we just announced um, FOSI, the Family Online Safety Institute, announced today uh, some research that they're undertaking to understand how families are thinking about this in the context of kids. So I think it'll be an ongoing conversation. For many years, I had uh, to tell my um, daughter stories about squirrels. This is what her interest was. And after like 60 or 70 stories about squirrels, I was out of squirrel stories. And I've seen parents of younger children using some of the generative AI to just give me a story about squirrels that includes a Star Trek theme. And it has been evidently a great relief, uh, unfortunately too late for, um, too late for me. Well, Ken, um, you are already enforcing 
AI regulation to the extent that um, a good portion of GDPR deals with many of the relevant uh, issues. So uh, how is the Irish State Protection Regulator looking uh, at all the drama around this latest wave of uh, activity? Thanks, Jules. It's great to be here at Cyber Week. Um, so as you mentioned, the GDPR naturally does apply to artificial intelligence systems where they process personal data. So that really is your first step as either a regulator or indeed as a controller or processor using AI systems is to understand whether and how exactly your AI systems do process personal data. Um, so it, the, the GDPR will apply differently depending on how your system goes about processing personal data. Um, so for example, if you use personal data to train the IA, AI system, that's one way in which the GDPR may apply. But similarly, if you use the model to make decisions or predictions about data subjects, even if those data subjects' personal data was not part of training the model, again, the GDPR will apply differently in that context. So once you've identified that the GDPR applies, um, by virtue of the fact that the AI system processes personal data, the full scale of principles of the GDPR then apply to that processing of personal data. Um, so, you know, even just taking it at its most fundamental level around lawfulness of processing, you must identify a valid lawful basis under the GDPR for all of your processing of personal data, including the data you use to train the system, if that is, um, if, it, if it is personal data that you use to train the system. And the President of Keneal mentioned earlier the question of scraping. I think that's a very pertinent issue to consider in respect of how you train your data. Um, the DPC has already made a very significant decision um, concerning Facebook's scraping of personal data that, or, or scraping of personal data that, that occurred on Facebook, I should say. Um, and the DPC imposed a 265 million euro fine in that case. Now, while that, that case doesn't concern AI, it's an important precedent nonetheless in considering lawful bases because this case really underlines how even when scraping data, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're scraping data that's already publicly available. In this particular case, um, the scrapers in question uh, manipulated certain features on Facebook that allowed users to find people who they knew, so search functions that allowed users to enter phone numbers that they already had to find the individual, a contact, a family member who was known to them. However, but using automated systems, it was possible for the scrapers to abuse these systems in order to enter random strings of numbers um, and then to determine whether there was a match. And if there was a match, you knew that you had a phone number and you knew that who, who owned that phone number. Um, so it's important to remember that when scraping personal data, it doesn't necessarily mean that that personal data is already publicly available. And certainly, even if you are scraping personal data, you have to have a lawful basis for that um, collection and use of personal data. I think, you know, the general principles of GDPR beyond lawfulness will be very pertinent for AI as well. When you look at the transparency principle, all of the usual transparency requirements apply to your processing of AI. But really, you know, what's perhaps different for AI in some respects is complying with the obligation to be transparent while letting data subjects know how AI might make decisions about them and what level of human involvement there is and how the results can be explained to data subjects. I think that accuracy will be a, a, a tricky topic as well. Um, complying with the principle of accuracy is absolutely crucial. So if you're using inaccurate data to train your model, that can result in inaccurate inferences being drawn, which depending on the purposes of the processing can be very problematic. And um, so after that, once you've identified how you're gonna comply with the principles, it's important to note as well that all of the data subjects rights apply to AI systems that process personal data. So access, erasure, rectification will all be matters that you need to consider. And this applies at all stages of the development and deployment process. So if there's personal data being used in training the data, if there's personal data being used in you know, making predict predictions during deployment, or personal data being used as a result of the prediction, or then even personal data in the model itself, you know, those rights of access, rectification, erasure are all matters that must be complied with. And finally, if I could just mention one right that might be particularly important in the context of AI systems, that's the right that's provided for in Article 22 of the GDPR and is, is matched in many other 
data protection frameworks around the world, which is the right not to be subject to decision making based solely on automated processing if that decision making results in legal effects or similar effects. Now, there are some limited exceptions to that right, but really the, the definition of what constitutes legal effects or similar effects is quite broad. So if the automated decision making is resulting in, for example, decisions about somebody's entitlement to housing, decisions about recruitment decisions, CV scanning, or even decisions around loan applications, that right in Article 22 applies. So it would be crucial to determine at what stage um, the automated decision making occurs and then to implement human intervention as well um, so that that a subject's rights under Article 22 are complied with. I'm looking at Professor Orly Lobel, whose most recent work uh, challenges the notion that human intervention is going to solve uh, some of our problems around automated decisioning. I'll let her opine in perhaps a bit uh, later. Um, but let me ask you this. I mean, I assume everybody, no matter where you're from in the world, has seen the story of the uh, U.S. lawyer who, uh, you know, filed a brief based on uh, chat GPT, right? This as big news as the cat lawyer. <laughs> we, we obviously have some excellent lawyers in the United States. Um, so um, clearly chat GPT said, oh, this is not always accurate. This makes things up. Uh, and yet a sophisticated individual, somebody who somehow passed the law degree and is practicing representing people in the courts, thought that it worked in a way that is very different than the way it worked. And so do we have this clash with uh, GDPR in that you, you have this science fiction novel writing tool that's actually good enough to do a lot of really useful work, but that says what well, there's nothing to correct. It's a squirrel story, right? Or it's a story about somebody named Jules Polonitsky, but it's making it up and it just seems to be so useful. But yet, so a company's going to be able to escape it by simply putting bigger disclosures, don't rely on this to file your court decisions, don't make employment decisions, but it's interesting and useful when we know what human beings are going to do. Is how will, you know, will, will regulators sort of see through that, you know, transparency or will companies be able to say, look, this is entertainment uh, for entertainment purposes only, right? Any thoughts on that? Sure. I think um, when you look at the GDPR um, and most data protection frameworks around the world, in, in the case of GDPR, Article 5 provides for the principles of processing and they're absolutely core to interpreting the full scope of the GDPR. And what occurs again and again in Article 5 is the purposes of processing. So what are the purposes of the processing? So when we look at large language models, for example, you know, what they do is essentially they predict on a basis of probability the order of words appearing in a sentence um, next to one another. So I think Kate touched upon it earlier with children and whether children would reasonably expect what large language models, for example, are doing. So again, looking at the principles, transparency will be key. And also, transparency can obviously go so far, but the reasonable expectations of data subjects will also be key. So if you're doing a data protection impact assessment, Jules, I think the, the risk that you've pointed out there is a very significant risk. So what type of measures can you take to mitigate that risk? Um, transparency obviously being part of it, but is are your transparency disclosures enough to make it clear to data subjects, to reasonable data subjects, that um, you know your, the, the system is processing your personal data in this way and producing results that aren't necessarily intended to be accurate? Um, so that's one risk that would have to be mitigated in a DPIA before deploying any um, large language model, model or other AI system. And if the risks are still there, of course, you have to consult the supervisory authority within Europe. Can I just add to that? It is an important risk, and we don't want some systems to hallucinate um, about people knowing that they, they that they do. And as part of those mitigations, it's a research problem that does have avenues that we're exploring. Like um, uh, once you have trained the model, right, and you query the model, and the output can be grounded in something like uh, in search. So that's part of the part of the mitigations we take is when there is a, a answer or a question in which a factual response is particularly needed as opposed to some of the creative questions that are, are often asked, that there's a check that can be done through search um, to double check and make sure that it um, is delivering a factual response. Now, it's not going to 
solve all hallucinations. We're not anywhere near there yet, but there is an element of this um, uh, research challenge and, and problem that, um, that, that we are working on in consultation with a lot of stakeholders. You know, there's a Jewish tradition, the holiday of Yom Kippur, when you atone for your sins. And in addition to saying various prayers, you, you list the sins. You say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I did this. I'm sorry I was rude to this person. There was a wonderful joke going around in Israel and in Hebrew-speaking countries. Uh, I'm sorry for all the times I said to Waze, no, I'm the passenger. Continue giving me directions. And so you can sort of see the, uh, the parallel here. Um, Audrey, the OECD has uh, really jumped from this intergovernmental thing that maybe most practitioners didn't have to think about to somehow achieving some consensus pretty quickly around um, AI principles that countries are, are looking at as a basis when they regulate. Can you give us a bit more insight into um, the, the document, the process, and, and where it goes next, perhaps, given that uh, uh, there's a new energy in, frankly, globally more engagement on some of these hard questions at the OECD? Sure. Thanks, Jules. I found I found the button. It's it's right there. Um, it's great to be here with you. I hope some of you at least have heard of the OECD. But if you haven't, um, as Jules said, um, we've, we're an intergovernmental organization of 38 countries, including Israel, uh, which just celebrated somewhat recently 10 years of being in the OECD. So. Um, we started looking at, I mean, one of the things that the OECD has done since its inception is look at science and technology and innovation and its relationship to the economy. And so um, we started, you know, 50 years ago looking at scientific discovery and, and technological advancement. So it was not surprising to see us look at, you know, take AI on um, somewhat, quote unquote, early and at least in the policy debate space. Um, we uh, do that through a bunch of different ways, but part of our role is to sort of bring complex technical um, issues before policymakers so that they can start to engage with the broader community and understand the issues and eventually try to get, as Jules said, consensus on um, on how to move forward. We mostly do soft, what we call soft law, so we, we don't do many binding treaty sort of documents, but we do consensus-based uh, sort of recommendation. So if you're all privacy people, uh, you will know the OECD privacy guidelines. They've been around for a really long time and they've been pretty instrumental in um, develop the development of privacy laws globally and not just within the OECD. So um, we, we could sort of see AI changing a lot and that led us to, to bring a group of experts together in around the 2016, 2017 timeframe to um, set out principles. Some of this came out of the G20. There was some, some, some early political leadership that if you were listening, People, if you, if you are connected at all to the industry, you could, you know, I mean, I used to work at Intel. There was a lot of acquisition of AI companies. There's, you know, lots of stuff was happening in the market. It wasn't surprising, you know, that AI was going to become a big policy topic. So um, we got everybody together and we um, eventually came up with a set of principles. They're the first intergovernmental standard to be adopted on AI. Um, there's five values-based principles and five recommendations for policymakers. So the values-based principles talk about all the things you would expect, transparency, accountability, um, well-being, human-centeredness, and I'll talk a little bit more about why it matters. And then the, the policy recommendations part talks about things that uh, government should do, policy action they should take to facilitate AI development and deployment in their country. So things like investment in research and development and enabling policy environment, international cooperation. And so um, it was, it, we got those done in record time. Uh, intergovernmental stuff takes a long time to do, but I think it took, I, it was actually before, right as I was coming into the OECD, but it took only about a year to negotiate those, which is pretty, pretty pretty fast um, so uh, we immediately after they were agreed started um, building what we call the AI observatory and the purpose of the AI observatory is you guessed it observe how the principles are developing and being implemented in countries and of course this was before quote-unquote generative AI but a, a big thing that we were trying to understand is what policy actions are countries taking um, and what effects are they having and I won't 
you know, go on at length because I know Jules has other questions, but you can go to OECD.ai and you can see what we sort of put behind the principles. And I think the biggest reason that they've become, to answer Jules's direct question of how do we go from sort of a sleepy organization where you may not have had to pay too much attention to, you know, one of the leading on AI, it was because we, we really started to put evidence, quantitative, qualitative evidence underneath the principles to help understand what was happening in the market. We look at patents, we look at jobs, we look at skills, we look at um, countries' policy approaches. And, um, you know, we were working on a paper on large language models a year before ChatGPT hit the market. So we've been able to be a little bit ahead and as a result, somewhat keep um, keep policymakers informed. That's always a challenge. And then I guess lastly, one of the roles that we've um, played is to help harmonize as much as possible definitions and methodologies um, between different legislative approaches across the OECD. So you'll probably know that the EU AI Act has adopted the OECD's definition of AI, which was something we worked really hard on back in 2017, 2018 to define. And the fact that, you know, our member countries um, can take our definitions and adopt them in their national legislation, you know, helps us get to a more cohesive, theoretically at least, we hope, a more cohesive international environment. For the record, as somebody who aspires to one day be appointed the U.S. ambassador to the OECD, I did not say it was sleepy, but but it may not know have that been, was your aspiration. But it may not have been an organization where, if you were doing day to day data protection compliance, where you looked to now. Of course, the OECD privacy uh, principles have also been a landmark, um, uh, you know, uh, setter. So it, it shouldn't be a surprise that the agency was uh, in a good uh, position to um, uh, to move to do so on uh, AI. But let me raise this question. Um, the EU AI Act was quite far along, and then all of a sudden, and, and obviously LLMs were, were not an unknown factor, but we weren't dealing with the explosion of activity and interest from ChatGPT to the other big tech companies, you know, also accelerating their efforts. And, and that really impacted the AI Act. All of a sudden, it was, wait, did this really work? Do we have to now look at this anew? Do we have to change? There, there was a huge flurry of activity. How did the, um, how do the uh, AI principles uh, stand up now that we see the drama of, you know, global rollout of uh, these technologies? So I think they're absolutely valid and 100% appropriate. They don't there, there are principles, like many principles, I assume it's the same for, you know, companies' principles like Google's and as well as others, you know, they're high level. They're meant to be a lens through which you look at key issues relative to AI. So the fact that you apply it to a generative situation, which by the way, we haven't defined yet, but we need to define, and this is this is another conversation, but um, the, 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 so they're ap absolutely applicable. I think the challenge is, translating them into what does it mean in the context of generative AI. And I think the first problem is that we haven't defined generative AI. We defined AI, and so we haven't defined what generative is. We as a community, not just we, the OECD, but nobody has defined it. We're trying to do that in what we're calling the Hiroshima process out of the G7. Um, uh, but uh, we, need to, we need to be clear about what we mean by generative AI, what's different relative to what we have long defined as AI, even in the OECD context, which is what's going to be in the, the AI Act in the EU and other countries and, 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 and policy approaches are adopting that as well. So the first question is, what's different? And so then you use the principles through the lens of what does it mean to be transparent about an, a model and a generative AIs? What does that mean? Um, I mean, we there's some of the very similar principles that exist in data, pre, data protection. and um, But the question of what it means to be transparent or what it means to be accountable um, might be different in different AI situations. So one of the things that we did about a year and a half ago, we developed a, a framework for classifying systems so that it's a, it's a high level way of walking through um, um, uh, the model that we develop for explaining an AI system. And so it, broadly speaking, has five components. It has a context, so that's sort of the world you're living in, why you're doing it, what it is. There's an input context, so the, there's an input, so that's data, whatever's going in. Then there's the model itself, the AI system, the model itself. And then there's what we call output, so what you're going to do with it, whatever it is. And then there's sort of the people and the planet, which kind of encircles all of this. So there's obviously a 
AI has a lot of sustainability and environmental impacts as well that we we sort of try to take into account. So using that model, we developed a system to sort of a, a, a classification framework to be able to look at what a system is doing in a particular context and a particular use to help policymakers understand eventually what is the risk to using a system in this context. Um, so all that happened long before OpenAI released their thing to the public. Um, but my, I guess my point is these are tools that are based on longstanding, on, you know, longstanding notions of what does it mean to manage risk? How do you understand risk? And so we have to take all that and apply it. And so the AI principles, um, I think, work very well in that case. We're thinking about things like should we develop guidance specific to their implementation in generative AI context? And I think that that is um, a, a good question, but we still have to define generative AI. Uri, when uh, Future Privacy Forum opened our Israel Tech Policy Institute a number of years ago, and great to see a number of the staff here, Rivki and Michal and uh, Limor, um, people said Israeli startups don't care about policy in Israel. They're looking at the world. They're looking at the U.S., Europe. They're 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 not worried about local uh, regulation. Yeah, Rivki, you're muted. Yeah, Rivki, I can innovate, um, and I think that's. Okay. Um, yeah, I think so. Just before that, just just a tip, Jules, uh, regarding your kids in in the story to your kids, change the squirrels to rabbits. They can't tell the difference. Believe me, it works like a charm every time. Okay, just just a tip on that. Um, but but I, I think that innovation policy in, in that sense, you know, it, it, it's the same question regarding all technologies. But I think in AI, it's a bit different because because of the scope. You know, because it applies to health, to transportation, you know, to education, to finance, and because of the speed of this technology, I think that you know the the the, the regula regulatory questions and the policy questions are much more acute. And I think that in this in the Israeli case, we can say that yes, we have a, start a startup nation, we have a, a thriving industry, but I think uh, uh, we totally you know dodge the ball in the sense that. Um, we, we we don't really feel as Israelis, and I'm guessing you know the the, the visitors to Israel. When when you go around Israel, you, yes, you know it's a startup nation. Yes, you know there's a bunch of startups here, but you don't feel it as Israelis. You don't feel it in the street. I'm guessing anyone who came here uh, by and any means of transportation didn't feel that they were in a in a highly uh, 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 technological country. And, and in that sense, I think AI could be you know a, a fresh start for Israeli policy uh, in that sense that yes we have we want to be competitive we want to have hundreds of startups leading startups in ai but we also want these startups not to look just you know across the sea but also in israel what these startups can do you know for our health system for our education system for our transportation systems and in that sense i think that you know the 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 regulators have to be part of that process uh, and I'm, you know, I'm an economist. You know, no, no one's perfect, but but uh, when when we look at that, I'm, I'm looking at incentives all the time, and I'm looking at uh, you know the regulators in governments. But I know very well the, the 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 regulators in the Israeli government. We have to think about you know their incentives to you know not to overregulate and to say because I think the safe the safe thing for any, every regulator to say is look, a it's forbidden. I'm going to wait to see, you know, what our friends from Ireland, our friends from France, our friends from, from the U.S. are going to do. And then we're going to, you know, make that uh, leap of faith or, or uh, not a leap of faith, but we're going to copy them. OK, I think that's a very reasonable and humane thing to do. And I think it will be a mistake. I think Israel has a place to say, yes, we're not just leaders in creating these technologies, but we can also be leaders because we're a small country. 
because of the low degrees, the, 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 the few degrees of separation between Israelis, okay, because the central government controls, you know, controls data and, and controls regulation, uh, basically, you know, it's the, the only the, the Ministry of Education they control the regulation for for probably you know most of the uh, of the education system. They don't really need to anyone else. We have a place to really be a leaders or a better site for AI regulation. Uh, but for that, the regulators should feel a that they're part of the process, b that they understand the technology, they are part of the technological journey in a sense, and and see that. Once things will go wrong, and things will go wrong, you know, we know that, okay? When, when cars were invented, things went wrong because people didn't know, people still don't know how to deal with uh, 900 kilos of metal driving in 100 kilometers per hour when someone is just uh, uh, busy texting all the time, okay? It's just, but, sorry? <laughs> Particularly in this country, thank you. Um, and, and imagine that when electricity was invented, you know, the regulators could say, look, I don't really know what's going on, but it looks dangerous. Okay, the regulators should be feeling that they're in a safe environment, obviously, to make you know, good judgment. But think about car accidents. You know, in Israel, I think, what's the number? 300, you know, people die in, in car accidents every year, probably, probably more. Um, suppose that the regulator will say, yes, I'm, I'm going with AI, I'm going with autonomous cars, and I'm going to allow it, and I'm going to be, you know, very open to that. And it drops from 300 to 50, okay? Those 50, people are gonna point at the regulator and say, that's on you. You know, these people have names. The 250 people that were saved do not have names because you're not going in the streets, oh, that could have been someone, but he, he's saved. And I think in that, uh, in that sense, giving the regulators, you know, the, the feeling that yes, they can make mistakes and we're all in a journey here, and sometimes in this mistake, you know, uh, uh, there, there will be consequences to that. But I'm very, very concerned about overregulation, and I'm concerned mostly in the Israeli case because it's a very, very easy decision to say we're a small country. Let's just wait until the big guys will make the decisions, and we'll just copy them. Kate, are you worried about overregulation? I mean, ten years ago. Uh, in this very room, uh, we probably had a conversation about uh, regulation, and probably the industry representatives were saying, "Don't regulate. We can self-regulate. Uh, you'll get it wrong. You'll you'll block potential you know innovations. Regulators don't understand the the technology well enough. It's moving too fast. You'll always be behind." And here, Google has called for regulation. Microsoft wants even licenses before you can use the technology or before you can use. A data center, Google, I think, has not uh, been eager to see licensing as maybe something very, you know, heavy or hard for, you know, startups or smaller companies. Um, but uh, your uh, your argument is we need regulation and we need it uh, quickly, and it needs to come from the democratic process. Is is that fair? Yeah, th th that's fair, and, I, and I'm uh, you know, a strong supporter of what we call public-private partnership. I learned that at the OECD many, many years ago. Um, but, but yes, I, I, I do believe that um, we shouldn't move from under regulation, and, and I do accept the claim that it, you know, for many years, in the last couple of decades, probably there was under regulation of technology. Uh, but if we move to the, from that to over regulation, I think, you know, that could, you know, from an Israeli point of view, A, hurt uh, the, our competitiveness in, in developing new technologies. But as I said before, of adopting these technologies in the Israeli sphere, and, I'm, and I think we have the, the case of blockchain a few for a few years ago, um, which no, I think uh, blockchain is not as um, impactful as AI. Uh, but in Israel, it was for, for a few years, and I think it's still the case to the best of my knowledge, the regulators just didn't say anything. Okay, they just didn't say anything. and 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 I know of dozens of blockchain companies that said, just regulate, just say what, what is allowed and what is not allowed. Okay, we'll adjust to any regulation, but not saying anything is the worst, uh, uh, is the worst outcome. And I think that, that should, we should you know, stay away from that scenario. I think that's the worst scenario. Um, Google's take is it is too important not to regulate, and it's too important not to regulate well. So we do think that there's a really important role of governments in making sure that we're unlocking the benefits for society at the same time as we're managing the risks. 
So when we think about a regulatory framework, um, there's there's a horizontal angle to this, there's a vertical angle to this. As we think about global regulation, it has to be, and, and governance, it has to be multi-layered. That includes standards, that includes best practices, it includes national regulation, and it includes international conversation. Um, it has to be interoperable. We need to strive, whether that's through the OECD definitions and the work that you did around there to make it as interoperable as possible with common set of definitions. And then we're thinking about what regulation looks like. Um, I'm a biologist. You know, we don't regulate the science of biology. We regulate the use of biology in medicine and health. Um, and so a similar, you know, it's not the perfect analogy, but I also think that way in the context of AI, there are going to be very specific sectoral contexts in which AI is deployed in medicine, in um, le the legal field, in uh, energy, departments of energy. And so we're going to need those agencies and those experts to think about how AI applies within their field. And so the sectoral element of regulation is going to be really important. Um, and then I think when it's um, the, you know, two other really important criteria are risk-based, which we all talk about in the privacy world. Um, but again, the AI-driven emoji wallpaper is just different than deep fakes, and we need to have the flexibility as a community, as an industry, as governments to um, uh, ensure that the appropriate mitigations apply to the different levels of risk. And finally, it has to be proportionate. So AI, when you think about, again, I'm a biologist, AlphaFold, which was the technology that predicted the folding of proteins, folding um, something that takes, you know, several years for one protein to predict the shape of it. AlphaFold was able to predict all of them, and we calculated that it saved five billion PhD years um, in scientific endeavor to do those predictions. And so, when we're thinking about the opportunity and the risk, the legislation, the regulation has to account for the risk of not pursuing a goal and the societal benefits that that could bring um, uh, equally uh, in, in, in balance with and, and together with um, a very you know, clear-eyed and hard assessment of the risks. Ian, I'll tell you what I am worried about, though, in, uh, in Europe. Um, I, I thought it was positive that in France, the AI regulator will be the data protection regulator. And hopefully uh, that means they'll talk to each other and we'll see consistent positions. But the EU AI Act um, didn't amend the GDPR and say, automated processing is already regulated. Okay, now here is some more insight of how you should do a privacy impact assessment. Put human extinction on your list of you know, impacts because we know that that's a concern now, right? Um, instead, it created another regulation and it said, oh, uh, yeah, consistent with the GDPR. And in some countries, it'll be a different regulator. Um, uh, we see, you know, open banking mandates, you know, in Europe. Uh, Limor worked with us in the OECD. We held an event with privacy regulators and banking regulators. And it turns out they don't always talk to each other a great deal. And you have competing mandates to share the data, but then the people who collect the data don't have a legal basis because it wasn't handed on. We, we, we have case after case of practitioners complaining that they're stuck in between competing regimes. Um, our Europe team looked at all of the automated decisioning cases that already are in place in Europe. There's case law. And you know who was most interested in the report? A lot of the regulators who weren't necessarily aware that Italy already had a case how do you see um, your agency integrating this sort of new act and GDPR uh, so that at least people who want to give clear guidance, you know, don't have to say, well, GDPR says this, but then the EIX, da, 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 da. How, how do you see this playing out? Thanks, Rod Jules. Um, so I think you mentioned in your comments there that the A Act doesn't impact on the application of GDPR, and that's really crucial. Um, so even there's there's two small ways in which completely, I suppose, more run of the course applications that of the AI, the proposed AI Act that might impact on the application of GDPR. But other than that, um, the AI Act supplements the GDPR. 
I suppose it, it, it could be defined as almost an update um, for this specific form of technology, but it generally does not stand in the way of the application of the GDPR. Um, before I get there, perhaps it, it, it's useful to mention for our international audience that there's been a very significant development this month in terms of the, the AI Act, and that concerned the European Parliament um, voting in phase, favor of the proposal, um, including by adopting the OECD's definition of AI. Um, why is that so significant? It, because it means that the next stage is the trilogue. So the Parliament, the Commission, and the Council will now negotiate to seek to um, seek to overcome any differences in terms of the proposals. Um, and it means that the timeline for the finalization of the AI Act is likely to happen this year. Um, in terms of the two small instances of the current proposal that might impact on the application of the GDPR, um, the first is Article 10.5, which makes a provision for this processing of special category data for monitoring bias in high-risk systems. And the second way is Article 54, which again is another way that provides a lawful basis for processing personal data when develop developing AI systems in a regulatory sandbox. So really, the GDPR application will be unaffected for the most part by the AI, AI Act. Um, so you might ask why is the AI Act needed um, in circumstances where we already have um, the GDPR, which will apply to the majority of AI systems. Um, I think that the proposal of the AI Act is very welcome to supplement the GDPR um, for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, as I mentioned earlier, maybe not all AI systems will process personal data, but that doesn't mean that they don't create a risk to individuals, so the AI, AI Act then will apply to those systems. Secondly, I think that the AI Act takes a different approach to um, the risk-based approach of the GDPR. It does adopt a risk-based approach, but Article 5 of the proposal goes a little bit further by prohibiting certain forms of AI systems, such as uh, pr uh, predictive policing and live facial, facial recognition technology. Um, what we've seen from the first five years of GDPR enforcement is that the principles-based approach of the GDPR has been used by many to argue that that principles-based approach um, amounts to an effective ban on certain business models or certain products, which of course the GDPR does not contain any express bans um, such as those. So I think it's welcome that if the legislature intends to prohibit certain systems, that they expressly do so in the legislation, because of course those matters are matters for the legislature, those type of policy decisions, um, rather than the principles-based approach, which really concerns applying standards of proportionality and necessity. I think it's welcome for the legislature to, to do so if they see fit to do so and, and to include those prohibitions. Uh, thirdly, I think the high-risk systems and the provisions of the AI Act are really crucial as well um, to supplement the GDPR. Um, we mentioned, for example, the obligation to conduct conformity assessments, um, which may supplement data protection impact assessments, but really they are very different. So conformity assessments are not new under the GDPR, oh, sorry, they're not new under EU law, um, but they are new to the G GDPR, they, they do not require it under GDPR. They really come from product safety compliance in EU law, and I think that they will complement data protection impact assessments, but they are important for going further with specific forms of technology. While, of course, AI is a very broad concept, it's far narrower than the scope of the GDPR generally. Um, so it is appropriate in those circumstances that specific requirements for AI systems are considered in conformity assessments. I think that more generally, Jules, to address your question around um, our interaction with other regulators and the interaction between regulating AI and regulating data protection, it's going to be a crucial challenge for regulators going forward, um, both regulators within the European data protection system, but also regulators globally, I think, as well. But it's not a new challenge necessarily. Um, already, the Data Protection Commission of Ireland, for example, is very well versed in cooperating with our other data protection regulators around Europe, but also now more recently cooperating with different regulators, for example, under the Digital Services Act in Ireland. The Media Commission is the regulator for the Digital Services Act and um, it is an area of ongoing challenge for us to ensure that level of cooperation, but it is, is an area that regulators have been working very closely on. For example, the, the Irish regulator is a founding member 
of the Digital Regulators Group in Ireland, which includes other digital regulators in Ireland, and to deliver that type of cooperation that is required. Let's see if we can get in a couple of questions uh, in the uh, time we have left. Can I look to the audience? Yes, sir. Who's thinking about AGI? We are. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the short answer is yes, we are thinking about that. And so when we published AI in Society back in 2019, which feels like, you know, a lifetime ago, it was like so far ago, um, you know, we talk about the spectrum of AI development and that AI is really, in some ways, it's like computing, right? It's it's like everything. And so there's artificial general intelligence on one end and there's you know computer vision and there's machine learning and there's um, robotics. These are all disciplines within AI. And so um, in some ways, I mean, wh one of the, not to give you, so, so the short answer is yes, not to give you an overly bureaucratic answer, but just to say that one of the things built into our process at the OECD is a constant review of our instruments to see if they're continuing to be fit for purpose. So that's a process we're starting right now for the AI principles that are four years old. Normally we do it around five years, but you know, who's counting? Everything's moving fast. We have to move as fast if we can, um, which is really hard in policy. So I think one of the questions we're asking ourselves now as we embark on the review of the AI principles is, you know, does, does AGI change anything in the, like, do we need a different principle? Is it different now? And so, yes, we are thinking about it. We've been thinking about it. I think we thought when we developed the principles themselves that they apply to any kind of, and are arguably any kind of emerging technology, but I'll put that aside lest I get myself in trouble. But the principles and the concepts that are there are going to apply across the board. But I think then the question becomes, as we look at AGI and we start to try to understand how close we are, what other tools do we need to supplement it? I'll suggest that uh, Jan LeCun, who has argued that generative AI and LLMs are an off-ramp on the path to AGI, may have an interesting point because of the nature of, uh, of the technology. Kate, did you have a comment on AGI? Has Google developed AGI? No. There was an employee who thought it would, but he, we, we all disagreed with him. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I think you see half, half of folks, um, you know, talk about large language models as just souped up statistical tools, right? Not a big deal. And then you have another uh, set of folks who's worried about, um, you know, existential threats from from AGI. And I think there's that, that, there's a range of concerns, right? And I think we would never dismiss any concern, right? Um, and, and two years from now, we could be stuck again. Two years from now, we could be accelerating on a, on a really fast path. We don't really even know right now which one that's, that's going to be. Um, but part of, the, part of what is very encouraging in some ways is just how much we're talking about it and how many people, how many like really thoughtful people are thinking about that question. And that's what I think gives, encourages us about, about um, you know, the work that's necessary to look at the whole range of risks to small to large. Take one quick question, the lady in the back in the red. Loud. I think I, meant, I think I mentioned proportionality, um, you know, in the context of regulation and I, I, you know, we're at cyber week. So one of the, you know, questions is like, as we think about regulation on general purpose AI, well, general purpose AI is what is, you know, also really feeding all the cyber tools that is going to make, um, 
you know, network detection really fast that's going to help us keep up and keep pace with the cyber threats um, that are using AI. So I think that the, it's the principle of the thing is when you're looking at regulation or when you're looking at how you're going to um, approach an issue that's AI is making sure you're looking at both how it's going to impact the, um, you know, the defensive or the, the beneficial uses of it, um, as well as the um, potential malicious uses of it would be my recommendation. Yeah, and, I, and what I just add to that is that that underlines the importance of conducting a data protection impact assessment before deploying artificial intelligence systems, um, regardless of what happens with the AI Act, AI Act and uh, conformity assessments. Data protection impact assessments are required now as a matter of data protection law. And in doing so, it's crucial to identify all of the risks, but also to consider alternatives to AI. That's part of necessity and proportionality. Consider those alternatives, evidence that you've considered the alternatives, and then if you're going to rely on AI, show how the alternatives are not as effective at delivering your purposes. Um, so it's crucial, you know, when deploying AI systems that you consider less intrusive alternatives and that effectiveness standard is part of the necessity standard in EU law. So if, um, if the alternative isn't as effective as AI would be, that might be crucial to your DPIA and reasoning why AI is required to achieve your purpose. Uh, no, I will give Yuri the last word, but I just want to say two, two other resources that might be helpful. One is the classification framework I just mentioned, because it is a step-by-step -step asking a bunch of questions to help you identify, you know, it, it, it may not answer the direct question of, is this proportionate to that, but it can help you come to that. It's a tool to help you come to some decision-making around that. The other thing we developed um, uh, is a, a, a catalog of tools for what we call trustworthy AI. And there's three types of tools in this database. It's publicly accessible. You can go to the website now. There's, um, there's uh, technical tools. So these are software tools and other tools that are applied in models and in um, AI situations to detect bias, to detect anomaly. So you can look at all, like, and it's, it's, it's open. The, the private sector contributes to this database. We keep the, the most recent ones were just submitted a week ago, I just was on the site looking at the latest. So there's a, a, a sort of catalog of tools, and you can see what's kind of available um, to help address some of some uh, some different issues that come up in AI. And there's on the technical side, there's normative tools, so things like principles and standards, and then there's educational tools. Um, and so those are you know part of what we're trying to do is make some of this information available and some of these resources exactly so that practitioners that are trying to evaluate. You know, because in the personal data space, sure, you need to do a privacy impact assessment, but that's a piece of a much, much bigger puzzle that AI is. And as as you said, not every AI system is going to be using personal data, but you know, so it's not the only it's not the only tool. You need you need a, another set of tools. We are over time. Let me just suggest that Uri, this is a project for um, FPF and the SNPI. If uh, advisors to startups don't have clarity on how to do a DPA and proportionality in novel areas because they haven't had to uh, assess. Um, it's perhaps for standards bodies or for best practices or experts to, to do some samples that people can, uh, can look to uh, to help accelerate innovation. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for joining me. Please thank you, uh, the panelists. And So um, I'll first introduce the panelists, and I'll start at the far corner. Uh, uh, Sharon Shemesh Azaria is the head of the International Department of the Israel Privacy Protection Authority, Rashut Haganat Apatiyut. Next to her is Chen Bartash Levanon who is legal counsel and also the data protection officer, the DPO, the INCD, the Israel National Cyber Directorate, which I think is one of the co-organizers of this like big week. Um, Shana Gillers is the chief privacy officer at TransUnion. And Elise Hulik is the chief privacy officer at Intuit. Um, the way we conceive this program is to focus in the first panel on the principles and in this panel on their implementation in organizations and in governance. 
Uh, of course, it's not a crisp and clear distinction because, you know, we'll address the principles also here and there is some repetition. Uh, but trying to kind of get more practical, I guess, uh, in this session. And I want to start by drawing two distinctions. One of them was actually discussed in the first session the distinction between generative AI and AI. So as everyone knows, when um, OpenAI launched uh, uh, ChatGPT very publicly in November, I, it completely sucked the air out of the policy room, out of every policy room. And everybody was focusing on AI, but maybe on generative AI, or maybe even more specifically on large language uh, models. But at the same time, and you heard this in the last panel, we've been dealing with and thinking about AI for years now. And, you know, we used to call it big data and machine learning and algorithmic decision making. And there are different sort of buzzwords and terms and phrases in different uh, times. But uh, like uh, to a large extent, these problems aren't really new. We've been um, grappling with them, struggling with them for, for a couple of decades, really, just, you know, maybe even before. So one issue I'd like to explore is to what extent these are like different things or is it really the same thing? And, you know, we've talked about sort of big data analytics and uh, automated decision making for, for many years. And maybe this is just um, a use case or an extension of that. The other distinction I'd like to explore concerns the type of companies that we're talking about. I'll let Shana and Elise uh, present their companies because uh, some people in the audience might not know TransUnion and Intuit, although they're giant companies. But when we talk about regulation and policy in this space, I think there's a big difference between um, regulating the developers of AI. So are we talking about open AI in, you know, an autonomous vehicle company, Cruise? Their product is the AI. Actually, the EU AI Act does draw the distinction between developers and users. Those are the terms there. Or are we talking about a company that is taking an AI component and integrating it into a bigger suite of products? So they're going to offer AI now as part of their bigger sort of uh, product suite. And think about Microsoft, for example. Of course, they're big investors in open AI. But they also have, you know, Microsoft Azure and Office, and they're now going to offer an AI as part of that, Salesforce. Companies you wouldn't think of necessarily as AI companies. And the third sort of um, tier is companies that are just using an AI tool in an enterprise context. And I think to a large extent, everyone is in that tier because even if you prohibit employees from using AI, as we've heard some major companies do or did, they're going to use it anyways, right? It's like, it's like prohibiting use of uh, Google search, like people will search. Um, so people are going to use generative AI and chat GPT and different AI tools, even if it's prohibited. But how can companies, enterprises allow, you know, or even incentivize use of these tools uh, without losing corporate property and trade secrets and IP and, you know, opening the door to all kinds of mischief. So with that introduction, I'll turn first to Shalon 
And I'll ask you from a regulator perspective, how do you think about these distinctions? Can you hear me? Okay. So first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, Omar, thank you so much for inviting me to speak here in this panel. Um, I would, like you said, we would, we should speak from the perspective of organizations because uh, this panel is talking about organization implementing products, not about developers. Um, so the first thing that we should do is, of course, raise awareness to the risks and to the point for the data flows. And data flows are very important once you talk about generative uh, AI. So again, uh, when we talk, I'm not talking now like with professional uh, data protection, but I'm talking to organi organizations that we would like to raise awareness to. So first of all, organizations should keep in mind that AI is a technology that thrives on vast amounts of data through the entire life cycle of the system, starting from the development stage, training the algorithm, testing input data that is fed into the system in order to make it dec decisions, and the output data of the system. Now, this is very important for our discussion in some cases of generative AI, input data that we as businesses, consumers, uh, put into the uh, system is again uh, served as training data to the algorithm the system we, we use it but sometimes we're not aware of the fact that the data that we're fitting into the system is being uh, used to train the uh, system and that means that it's also being shared and it's also uh, uh, creating risk for data breaches and leakage of data okay this is something that most people are not aware of organizations are not aware of so this is something that first of all we should um, um, keep in mind. Um, there was this case of a doctor using ChatGPT and he wanted to generate letters to his clients so he put into the system uh, health data of uh, his clients which is uh, of course very sensitive data. So again awareness is I think the first thing that we should, uh, the first step in, uh, in implementing data protection. Um, additionally, like Omer said, many times um, uh, the system is integrated with other systems within the organization uh, and sometimes uh, uh, the data is shared within the organization or outside of the organization and all of those data flows again create uh, uh, risks for data. So we should keep in mind the data flows within the organization and outside the organization. Um, many times the data fed to the system is, of course, personal data, and therefore organizations need to make sure that the data handling complies with the privacy protection law and regulations. Because again, this doctor that used ChatGPT and uh, put inside health data of consumers, uh, probably being unaware of uh, his, he was probably unaware of the fact that he was uh, uh, in compliance with the Data Protection Act of uh, his country. Um, so, uh, when we talk about implementing data protection, that of course applies to the whole life cycle of the data, including the collect, the stage of collection, storage, usage, processing, sharing and deletion. And again, sharing is a, a key word here because it's shared inside the organization and outside. Now, talking about AI generally, we can say, and we've already heard in some panels um, today and, you know, this is a long uh, discussion, long time discussion. AI can challenge the basic principles of data protection and therefore it's important to outline the risks for data and possible means to mitigate them. So first of all, and I think that's uh, the downside of being the last regulator to speak today, because my colleagues, um, first of all, uh, President Denise from CNIL and uh, Kian O'Brien from uh, the um, uh, DPA of Ireland, uh, we talked about the risks or the principles that apply on data protection in terms of uh, privacy. So first of all, you need a legal basis to process the personal data. Uh, you have a purpose limitation that, and that means that you should stick to the purpose for which you collected the data. And if you want to use the data for any other purposes, you need a legal basis or you need to receive the consent of the individual uh, from which you collected the data. Lack of transparency in our uh, Privacy Protection Act, there is uh, an obligation for uh, uh, transparency and that means that uh, you need to notify data subjects about the fact that you're collecting data, what type of data, the purposes for which you're taking, collecting the data, the usages, 
third parties which will receive the data. And when we're talking about AI, uh, the way the, the machine works, the way you make the decisions, um, and um, again, why it's you, what it is used for. Um, knowing the logic of uh, the system can assist data subjects to contest the decision made about them and enhance their control over the data. Um, transparency also assists data subjects uh, to exercise the rights such as del deletion and correction of inaccurate data uh, or to uh, mitigate biased decision decisions which are based on unrepresentative or uncompleted data. But the problem with AI is that sometimes we encounter the black box problem, which makes it hard to explain the decision. And additionally, many times users are not aware of the fact that the data is being reused to train the algorithm. So again, you know, the, 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 what characterizes um, ChatGPT, for example, is the fact that we are not aware of the fact that the data that we as an organization feed it uh, is personal data and it's being reused and shared. Um, another important principle is consent like, and, and lack of transparency, again, can reflect on the consent because if you're not aware of how the system is used and how the, our data is used, um, then again, we can't really give uh, informed consent. Another problem is re-identification. AI integrates data from many sources, thus increasing the probability of re-identification. And that means that even if you're using data that we think is not personal data, sometimes there is a risk that it is identified. Data minimization is a very important key in principle in data protection. And again, AI thrives on mass amounts of data, so it contradicts the obligation for data uh, minimization. Um, accuracy um, and uh, accuracy is another important but, uh, principle, but sometimes training, training data uh, is incorrect or unrepresentative, and then it can lead to wrong or biased decisions. And data security, data security, of course, is another aspect which we should address. And we should be mindful of how the system is built, what are the uh, um, relevant data breaches that might, might occur. And another important uh, breach is uh, data poisoning. And that means that the data that we feed into the system might be uh, poisoned or fed with the uh, wrong uh, information and there it destructs our system and decisions. So in order to um, combat the risks or uh, mitigate the risks, uh, we have of course tools which are written in our uh, act and our uh, regulations. So we'll start with the accountability. Accountability is of course the first thing that uh, will help us mitigate any risk in our organization. So in terms of data protection, um, we would strongly advise to conduct a privacy impact assessment in your organization. That means mapping the types of personal data held by the organization uh, that the systems might use. Uh, and that includes, of course, clients' uh, data, employees' data, uh, assess the sensitivity of the data, map wh who has access to the data in the organization, who needs to access the system to conduct their tasks, Try to identify point of data sharing to secure them and uh, try to identify risks for data leakage. Um, another thing that I could uh, uh, include in the accountability principle is training employees who have um, uh, access to personal data. Explain to them how the system works. Data that is fed to the uh, system may be used to train the data, thus creating data sharing and might find its way back to, as input data, which infringes privacy again. Your employees need to know that. Um, black systems that may infringe, Omer talked about it. There are some major companies um, who realize the danger, the risks of uh, generative AI. And therefore, they, for example, ban the use of generative AI. So first of all, black system that may inf infringe data or limit access to, to only trained workers. First of all, trained workers and workers that need access to those systems to perform their tasks. Um, and of course, teach them about data protection and their obligations according to data protection laws and regulations. Um, if you're- Sharon, okay, so we can unpack this toolbox during the uh, panel. I suggest we let okay. the other panelists also weigh in. So um, let's close. Okay, so I'll just close by try to find, for example, you said you, you, you purchased your systems. Try to find audible systems that you can audit and, and make sure that 
your supplier uh, gave you uh, a system that complies with data protection laws. You can do, do it in your contract and try uh, to, uh, that means even design the system accordingly, um, try to implement uh, privacy enhancing technologies in order to reduce, reduce the risks for uh, leakage and for uh, unlawful or unnecessary data sharing. Thanks. Chen, from the uh, cybersecurity perspective, do you have thoughts about the build versus integrate sort of AI question? Yeah, well, when you are building the tools, you need to secure them throughout their life cycle from development to deployment and through ongoing operations. And the responsibility to do that is on you as the developer. However, when you are integrating tools into your system, the first thing that you need to do is a risk assessment. And, and especially with cybersecurity risks, it's very important to understand the security measure, measures and the potential vulnerabilities of the tool. But that is not enough, since we already know that supply ch chain attacks can be devastating for organizations. It's important to not only check the tool itself, but also the vendor that you are engaging with. So it's important to check its cybersecurity posture, as well as data handling practices, to make sure that the data is being stored and transmitted in a way that is secured and protected from unauthorized access. Um, there are, few, of course, more things that need to be considered when we're talking about integrating tools into your systems. As Sharon said, it's very important to check um, all aspects of compliance with data protection laws to ensure that the collection, the processing, the storage of personal data through AI tools is actually compliant with relevant laws and regulations and that you are able to um, to obtain proper consent and to maintain principles of transparency and explainability, which are sometimes difficult when we are talking about AI tools. Um, and to remember also that the scope of legitimate processing can change when you're doing that through AI tools. And the last thing that I'll mention in, in regards to integrating tools into your system is intellectual property rights, especially when we're talking about generative AI tools. It's very important to understand the IP implication of using these tools and to carefully check the terms of use so you can understand what can be done with the information that you put into the system and also what you are allowed to do with the outputs. Great. Shana, I, I, I'm actually thinking you know, when, when you think about AI regulation and um, automated decision making regulation, the thing that comes to mind for me first is the Fair Credit Reporting Act, actually. And of course, it's from 1973, I believe. So it's um, incredibly, it's 50 years ago. Um, but it actually, you know, regulated the all important credit score that kind of is the arbiter of a lot of important decisions uh, in the lives of uh, every American. And it has the principles of transparency and explainability. Uh, and I, I think what some people don't know is that the score was actually created to prevent bias and discrimination that, you know, was made possible by a credit um, officer in a bank sitting eye to eye with, um, with a client, a customer who wants to get credit and the officer is saying, you don't look right to me. So they came up with the system and algorithm. And of course, it's being um, uh, governed by consumer reporting agencies, one of which is TransUnion. So is this discussion even new or is the, uh, has, you know, I, I'm talking about the 50 year old law. No, that, that's, a, that's a great question and great context. Um, so just, you would ask that I introduce um, my company, yeah. TransUnion. Um, so TransUnion is 
um, a global information and insights company. We operate in over 30 countries. Um, and as an Omer, Omer was alluding to, probably the best thing that we're known for is being a credit reporting agency or a credit reference agency um, and either the largest one or one of the three major ones in most of the regions in which we operate. Um, and so, yes, to some extent, right, the, the, the Fair Credit Reporting Act in the U.S. absolutely, you know, was governing, you know, how you use and develop these scores for many, many years. And just to kind of pile on to what you were saying, it absolutely was initiated to reduce and prevent bias. We recently... Um, all the credit reporting agency CEOs just recently testified in Congress. Um, and one of the congressional members really discussed very movingly about how you know this act really helped prevent some of the injustices that as a black man, his father um, had encountered in the US when applying for credit. So yes, yes to all of that. Um, you know, so you know, companies like TransUnion, credit reporting agencies have been dealing with AI in, in models and in making sure that those models are fair um, and eliminate bias and discrimination for a long time. Um, and, and many other companies have been using AI um, in similar or perhaps slightly different contexts um, for a very long time. And I think that, you know, the very fair question is, well, what is new now? What has changed now? Um, and I think that many of us, you know, no matter what company you're sitting in, you may have been, you probably were dealing with and governing AI and you understood how your company was using it in a very specific and regulated way. And probably you've had processes um, that you've developed over time to handle the specific issues that the models that you're building um, are dealing with. And what has changed in the last several months is it, it's just ChatGPT, right? It's just captured the public imagination and it's captured the imagination of every employee in your company, right? So every employee is now thinking, oh, how can I use this tool in a way that's going to save me time, that's going to, you know, maximize efficiencies, that's going to reduce costs. Um, and so all of a sudden you're going from a place where, okay, you really have a handle on it, you've got processes to manage the way in which your company uses AI. You've gone from you know, a select number of people and you know who they are and you know the different stakeholders that have all the right processes to all of a sudden everybody wants to experiment with AI um, and they're probably not even aware of all the processes that you have in place, right? They're not even tied into them. Um, so I think what, what most companies are quickly going through is, well, yes, you can just turn it off on your system, which is probably like the blunt instrument approach, right? Which your CISO probably wisely um, has done, or if not is wishing that she had, right? But, but then, you know, there are going to be like probably three people in the company that are happy with that approach, right? Like I would be one of them, right? Um, but everyone else is going to be banging down the door, open this up, like let us use this tool. Um, and so that's where that's where this change comes in right now, and that's the moment that 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 many of us are in, where we're figuring out how do we take the tools and processes that we already have that have worked for a very long time, but tweak them, modify them. Where are the gaps? But more importantly, make sure that everybody in the organization now who wants to use ChatGPT, which as I said is everybody in the organization, right? So make sure that everybody knows, you know, you're a little bit serving as a traffic cop. If you want to use it, then you have to do these steps. You have to go to this forum. You have to go to this process. Um, so I think, you know, that, that to a large extent is what has changed and what you're seeing responsible companies who want to innovate, want to do so responsibly, really trying to modify and tweak um, and roll out new processes if possible to deal with this exciting moment that we're in. So thank you for that. I actually do want to go into the weeds and explore some of these organizational processes and, you know, what they look like or should look like. Uh, but before that, Elise, maybe tell us where does Intuit sort of sit in the, in the stack and how do you see, you know, this issue, this question emerge uh, yeah. just in your day-to-day -day work? Yeah, absolutely. So as, as a chief privacy officer at Intuit, um, I care about all the personal information we process. I care about whether we process it through generative AI 
or a typewriter, right? Like that's, that's the baseline, right? And so we have to do all of the things we have to do in terms of data protection assessments, uh, data mapping, data flows and stuff, anytime we use personal information. Generative AI does not change that. And so, you know, when I think about the type and kind of products and services we offer, we're, we're uh, fintech, basically. We have some direct-to-consumer products and brands. Uh, you may be familiar with Credit Karma as one of our brands. TurboTax is a tax software preparation uh, feature. We also have a lot of financial account management software solutions for small businesses, right? So QuickBooks, ledger management, workforce management, payroll management. Uh, we, we have MailChimp. Uh, is another brand of ours where uh, small businesses use them to do email marketing campaigns, things like that. So that's the situation that we're in now where we're thinking about not only the workforce that's banging down the door across our enterprise to use this new technology, but also how are we going to smartly embed it into products and services so that these smaller businesses can have a leg up and have the same level of playing field that some of the bigger players in the market do. And the appeal and the allure of things like generative AI, chat GPT being one example is, yes, it's captured the imagination, but what it's done is created this very seamless and easy to use experience where you're interacting with this software, this feature that feels very human and comes back with answers. And it's designed to do that and make it look and feel very easy for you. And so in that context, you have to think about what does that mean for transparency for your users out in the world who may or may not know that they're providing information in this context? It, what does it do for your workforce when they're building? How do they know that you've got processes and procedures behind it? And for, for us, for our purposes, um, we did turn it off briefly so that we could get our ducks in a row because we realized this was a pretty pivotal moment in time. And then when we turned it on, we turned it on in a very specific way. It was cordoned off. It was in-house entirely. Um, we had rules and, and procedures about whether you could use personal information in certain circumstances. In many, you could not. And we gave time and space for people to learn and ideate and understand the technology. So good example being, you know, the entire legal department got to play in our own designed sandbox. Right? We get to interact with the tool, learn what it is, because even the lawyers have to learn about this technology. Right, You can't escape it. And if you're going to be advising product teams on what they need to do, if you're going to talk about IP rights and how they might be affected, if you're going to look at the tax implications of using certain things, privacy, you have to understand what it is that the developer or whomever you're engaging with within the enterprise why they're asking what they're asking, how they're trying to use it, what they're trying to do. So you need to sit down and, you know, I, I will share with you all. I developed my own craft cocktail with our generative studio oh, thing. Nice. And it was, it was delightful. I guess I got to say, no hallucinations there. It was a great drink. But, but, you know, this is the kind of thing. And just interacting with tool, getting used to it, understanding how it could work is the first layer. And you do that in a very safe way in a sandbox where you're not sharing company information. You're not sharing personal information. You're just interacting with it to learn the technology. Then we can talk about layering experiences and having the processes and procedures built around that experience so that when the time comes to raise your hand and say, I actually want to leverage personal information, you're triggering impact assessments, different things like that, all the policies and procedures that we have built in so that you can grow from there. I noticed you piqued uh, uh, Jules's interest with the uh, uh, GPT crafted cocktail there. Second use case after the squirrel stories or the rabbit stories. Um, just uh, interestingly, you know, from my organization's perspective, so I'm a lawyer, I work at a law firm, and I think a bit like Shana, we would be happy like if this thing didn't exist, uh, primarily because it's going to replace us. And, and you know, and, uh, we're kind of one of the first professions to go, it looks like. Um, plus, there are risks for using it, um, proprietary information, and in our case, it's the privilege, right? Um, perhaps uh, we can compromise privilege if we use it to address uh, cases, not even talking about hallucination, you know, about case uh, citations, but at the same time, 
Like there's no question even. It's obvious that we have to use it. We, we are going to use it and we're using it just because these are incredibly powerful tools. Um, you know, and I think some of us, maybe all of us here on this panel are lawyers and just trying to, you know, get a response from Lexis uh, or from Westlaw, uh, you know, talk about um, query architecture. It's so difficult, and, you know, it takes you like 20 years to hone your skills and now you can do it in a plain English type of way and just ask and get like input from I mean knowledge management is key for law firms and this is you know this is it like uh, so uh, uh, so I think there's no question really about like whether we implement everybody is implementing and it's not even a question of time it's happening right now from an organizational perspective, one question that has been, you know, debated and I think will be debated is who who should be responsible for, for it? Like, who is the chief AI officer? Um, and again, I think there might be a difference between types of organizations, right? At, at OpenAI, maybe it's not the same type of person as in a bank. Um, but I, I, I just wonder from your perspective and your organizations and then from the regulator perspective, um, is this the um, chief privacy, you are chief privacy officers, is the, the, are you it? Are you part of the solution? Is there a committee and you're a part of the committee? As you know, Chen mentioned uh, risks to IP and to cybersecurity, of course, um, that's not a CPO file. Function. So, um, so how does it look like? Is it shaping up in your organization? Uh, yeah, I think that's exactly right. For, from my perspective, um, I think the more eyes on this, the better. Um, you don't want to get to the point where you have so many people in the room that no one can make a decision, right? And so we have a, you know, a governance process where we have a lens through which you know, it can get escalated up to the general counsel to whom I report. So I'm situated in legal, sometimes privacy is in compliance, sometimes it's in IT. We happen to be situated in legal. Um, so I come at it from a, you know, and I'm expected to bring sort of the legal lens through all the different ways we use data, but you're exactly right. Our CISOs involved and in looking at it through the security angle, we've got compliance looking at it. You know, think about all of the different financial regulations that we come across. Um, you know, and, and making sure that we're not engaging with, you know, forbidden parties, different things like that. You've got to look at it through that lens. Um, and then just sort of also, and I don't want to lose sight of this, there's a commercial angle to this, right? When you're thinking about risk to a company um, and how to deploy any kind of technology and whether the extent you're going to embed this throughout your product life cycle, things like that. There's a whole suite of risks and there's a whole suite of opportunities. And that's what you've got to look at. And that's the conversation that needs to be had. What is the true commercial upside if we go down a particular path or if we don't go down a particular path? And then leveraging your already established, if you're fortunate enough to have it, governance process at the company is the fastest way to get some momentum there. Creating a bespoke separate process, in my experience, has not served many places well because it is another avenue to confuse people and maybe give them reason to not go down the right path or forward. So if you can build upon processes that are already in place, particularly if you have a risk function or something like that, um, I think that that's going to help people navigate that a little bit better. Shana? Yes, yeah, so, so you've asked a question that I love to answer, which is to talk about you know, organizational risk design. Um, so I'll, I'll try not to go off for too long. But, um, but you know, in, in our company, we've got um, a growing enterprise risk management framework. And I think you know, the concept of risk management, as Elise was just saying, like, if you're lucky enough to have one of these things, this is the best place to put it. Um, and I think for, for each company, you're going to have your own risk taxonomy about what are the biggest risks that you've identified. And that's going to help you figure out who is it in the organization that's best suited to own this particular risk. Um, and it may be that it is not just one stakeholder, um, but it may be that there are multiple processes that already exist um, that, that cover this, right? Because you don't want to be reinventing the wheel. You don't want to be jumping at this shiny new thing and creating some 
you know, standalone process that, to your point, at least confuses people. Um, so for our organization, there are already several processes where, you know, uses of AI should go through. And I think many companies would find the same thing, right? We have a product governance process, which many places have. We have a third party risk management governance um, process, which, which many companies have. And those are two kind of obvious places for AI risk to be considered. Um, we're also in the process of rolling out our enterprise risk um, framework and, and iterating on it. And so this was actually a really good time to set up um, what we're now calling the data risk committee. We already had a privacy committee, which I chair, um, but this was a good opportunity um, for us to continue to iterate on our risk governance at the company. And so we instituted a data risk, company, or data risk um, committee that is not just AI, it will govern a host of data um, analytics and data governance related risks. Um, but certain AI issues will come through this company, through this committee and to the question of who chairs that. Um, so we have our data analytics folks um, who, who chair that. And I think um, this is also another kind of favorite topic of mine, which is, you know, who owns compliance in the first instance? And so there's a concept of three lines of defense. So the first line of defense is the business who is implementing products and solutions. And the idea is that they own, folks are probably very familiar with this, but like they own compliance with risk in the first incident. So it's similar to privacy by design. As you're developing your tools, you have to comply with law. Um, and so I think this actually really fits nicely with that framework that our data analytics team um, or really the first line of defense um, for, in this instance, AI risk and, and data risk more generally, and so appropriate for them to, to own it. Great. Chen, do you have thoughts about this, or I guess a parallel question from a national perspective is which regulator should be tasked with it? And there are two regulators here. Don't fight for the microphone, but uh, which regulator is in charge of regulating AI? Well, um, we try to work in cooperation since a AI regulation have ma many faces, right? So we'll want to address the cybersecurity aspects and then Sharon's team will want to address the privacy aspects. So I think the most important thing is really to make sure we, we keep the communication going between regulators and not like try to say we own that and don't interfere with, with what we're doing. But it's it's a very much process that is evolving since the field is rapidly evolving. So I think the key is really just to, to keep com communication between all regulators and build something holistic. So as we've heard, um, I would say that AI is, is multidisciplinary. Um, so there are a lot of uh, regulators involved. Um, from a policy perspective at the moment, you know, the science uh, issued, the science uh, ministry uh, uh, issued a report about AI regulation and policy and its recommendation was not to have specific regulation for it at the time. So that means no specific regulator. Having said that, and they also uh, decided not to change the laws at the moment. Having said that, looking at what's happening abroad, um, looking at the GDPR, for example, and the provisions about um, automatic decision making, that means that um, I think the DPAs are very fit and well equipped, I would say, to regulate aspects of AI. Of course, data protection goes without saying, but even, um, for example, biased, biased decisions. Um, privacy protection is about human rights. The right for privacy is a basic human right. It's a constitutional right. And therefore, what we do is also always balance between interests when we uh, protect data. When we talk about algorithm uh, bias, it's also the right for me for equality, the right for me not to be discriminated. So I think that a data protection regulator can at least do this task of um, um, regulating bias. Um, and of course we have the tools for it because we have uh, technological professionals and we have a forensic lab. So we 
have the know-how to uh, implement law on technology. But of course, in, and for example, in Europe, uh, the EDPS, which is the privacy uh, DPA of the EU, uh, has an important role in uh, the AI Act. Um, but of course, the Data Protection Authority can't be the only authority to regulate AI. And of course, my colleague here has a, an important role in AI and protecting, uh, uh, protecting um, in, uh, critical infrastructure. And other uh, aspects like uh, intellectual property, of course, it's not the role of the DPA to perform. Yeah, great. Uh, I have to say this same answer came up uh, uh, in the plenary stage from uh, your colleague Gilad Mama, the commissioner. I wonder why. And, <laughs> and, um, uh, and, you know, I responded to that, that there is a very similar statement to what you just said in the United States, an interagency statement from the heads of the FTC, DOJ, CFPB, and the EOC, uh, who said a couple of months ago that, well, there's no specific AI legislation in the United States. There is no exemption from the law that, you know, for AI systems, and therefore all existing regulations apply, and each agency has its own jurisdiction over it. So it's not that we don't have an AI law. We have a lot of AI laws or laws that touch AI. Uh, let's take a couple of questions if there are. Yeah, the gentleman. Yes. Yes. You know, I, th I think our starting point is, and it's very similar to how you approach whether you're using certain data sets or not. Um, you can't have explainability without intention, right? I think, I think there, there are going to be things that we're all going to learn about the technology that we don't have visibility into right now. I think that's fair to state. But I think when we as an organization either decide to create a model or pull in someone else's model or something like that, foundationally, we need to know why we're doing it, what we expect it to do, do testing, do monitoring for that, and then have a very crisp way of explaining that to whomever's information or processes that we're engaging with who are our customers out there in the world why we're doing it making it known that we are doing it in the first place and really stepping through the reason why we're leveraging ai in this context is x y and z and this is how we expect this model to operate and these are the ways that we're looking at making sure it does so and if things change we are committed to addressing issues you know, coming back and checking and double checking. And that may be as good as it gets, at least initially, but that's a better starting point than AI is a mystery. We'll all see, you know, I mean, you really have to be very intentional when you're trying to leverage some of this technology. And I think that will go a long way. Yes. Yeah, so I, I haven't done a survey of who's you know who's coming most but i think it i think you just you have to assume that it's everybody like and it's probably in places where you wouldn't expect it like your comms department your communications department probably like you you know you've seen like even like serious journalism you know newsrooms are experimenting with using ai for a first draft like your communications department your marketing department is probably looking to use it in the same way to use it for a first draft to your point, when you think about like the risks of the company, you know, are they looking to use personal information in that? Probably not. Are they looking to use, you know, confidential information in that? Maybe. Um, so it may be that, you know, some of the uses that they're seeking, that some parts of the company are less risky than others. You know, I think another obvious way that people assume that folks want to use it is in HR. Right. And that you, you're dealing with associate, you know, employee information. That's going to be obviously personal information um, that could be um, that's obviously could be sensitive. Um, but I, I and certainly, you know, folks in technology, folks in data and analytics, if you have, you know, such a function um, for sure, they're going to be looking to use it. And I would also say, like, don't think the legal department isn't looking to use it. Right. Like. Right, you're looking everywhere else. I mean, I, I sit in the legal department. Like, oh, I actually need to check with my colleagues because because yes, they they are also looking to use it. Um, hopefully, in ways that are safer than the not the cat lawyer, right? But the right the guy who used ChatGPT to um, to to write his brief and it hallucinated and made up cases. 
PIA again is part of your accountability, so it's a high, high recommendation uh, to do so. Uh, in terms of enforcement, I would say that an orga organization that can prove that it uh, truly uh, and, and meaningfully <laughs> conducted a, a serious PIA, and that means that it did a serious job, meaning mapping all your uh, data, mapping all your risks, all uh, the access, uh, uh, the, 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 all, keeping records of access, mapping access controls. Um, if you did a, a reasonable job, then you know sometimes uh, we're talking about a risk-based approach. So that means that there is no case in which there is zero risk. So between um, the approach of having a serious risk assessment, I would say that it would help you with your uh, enforcement actions or to prove compliance or to deal with your regulator. And when you do, when you don't do a PIA or when your PIA is like you said, done in an unserious way, I guess the consequences will be accordingly. And by the way, it's not only the regulator that you need to answer for, it's also your clients and data subjects that can sue you and damage your reputation. So a serious PIA is highly recommended. Great. With that, uh, uh, uh let me just thank you all. Let me thank the FPF uh, and Israel Tech Policy Institute team for another great program. Uh, to stay in touch with our activities in Israel, techpolicy.org.il. And we look forward to working with you.